Welcome, everybody. Welcome back to Photo Justice Photo Moment, a very special live edition where we are talking about the brand new just announced GH5S. And now we're going to compare the GH5S to the GH5. If you have missed the GH5S intro video that we just did, just click up here and that'll take you back and watch that first. It's just a few minutes long, gives you the top level features. But now we're going to compare the top level features of the S to the non S and we'll see what the differences are. So we are doing this live, which means we do have a live audience. We do have a lot of questions coming in already. If you've got a question, be sure to pop it up into the comments and put at photo Joseph in front of it. That will allow me to see that you have a question for me. And as I scroll through here, I will try to address those questions. Martin's saying, you just had to get us back. You can't help showing off the new studio. Hey, I'm, I'm enjoying the new studio. This is kind of fun. And let's see, lots of comments here. John saying, what do you think of the chances of time code in out support making it to the GH5 through a firmware update? I, that's a good question to start off with. I don't think that's technically possible. I think there is physical differences in the PC port, but we're getting ahead of ourselves here. So um, let's, uh, let's try and address all the questions here. So let's go, oops, let's bring up to this one first. Let me get my slides queued back up here and get the right one up and there is the right slide. Okay, here we go. So GH5S versus the GH5. First off, the biggest, biggest difference is the sensor itself. The GH5S has a 10.2 megapixel low light 14 bit multi aspect sensor versus the GH5's 20.3 megapixel 12 bit sensor. Okay, so what is, what does the difference really mean here? What are we talking about? Well, I'm gonna find the right position to stand in here. Um, lower, lower resolution means better low light gathering capability because the pixels on the sensor are physically bigger, right? When you have to have fewer sensors in any given amount of space, right? If this is your, if this is your sensor and you have to put 20 million versus 10 million pixels in here, well, there's, there's a bigger pixel when you have a lower number. This is one of the things that has come up throughout the ages of the, uh, the resolution wars as everybody's going crazy to get the highest resolution cameras. And this kind of, this kind of ended a few years ago, although the, I guess Canon has kicked it up with like a 50 or some crazy megapixel sensor on a 35 millimeter frame size. Anyway, um, when you have fewer pixels, they're bigger. So that means lower noise, better low light gathering capability. That is one of the huge things that this camera is all about. The ability to have that low light gathering capability on this tiny little sensor. Best low light capability, gathering capability ever seen in a sensor of this size. So this is a really big deal. This is very, very important. But you lose resolution, right? We're going all the way down to, what, 10.2 megapixels. So if you're shooting stills, 10 megapixels, it's like, that's tiny, right? Uh, by today's standards, that's really, really small. That doesn't mean that you can't shoot stills with it. By all means, it will still be a very good, very capable capable low light stills camera, but that is not who this camera is designed for. This camera is designed for the cinematographer, specifically those looking for that low light situation. Now this camera, as you're gonna see here, it really is all about the cinematography. So that's the first thing. Um, 14 bit versus 12 bit. So you do get a little bit more dynamic range. That is something that was required to take advantage of this low light capability. And then the multi aspect ratio. Now this is a this is an interesting thing that I'm, I gotta be honest here, I'm not totally 100% sure that I got my head wrapped around this, but here's how I understand things. When you look at Micro Four Thirds, Micro Four Thirds from the beginning was designed so that the sensors could move, so that you could have image stabilization built into the camera. This camera does not have that. This camera has no image stabilization built into the body, it's only the lens. So right there, a lot of people are not going to want this camera, and that's perfectly fine. If you need, if you want in-body stabilization, you wanna be able to do handheld shots, super smooth, the GH5 is the camera for you. The GH5S is a much more specialized camera. This is for people who are gonna put it on a gimbal, put it on a crane, put it on some kind of noise, uh, a vibration absorbing device, and shoot from there. So we're, we're gonna talk more about the, uh, the lack of stabilization later and why that's the case. But because that isn't in there, I was starting to say how from the beginning, Micro Four Thirds was designed to have a stabilized sensor, which means that the lens hole and the lenses needed to be able to accommodate, needed to be a little bit bigger than necessary to accommodate for a moving sensor. When you take out the need to move, you can make the sensor bigger. And what I think, and I cannot confirm this, but what I think is happening here is the sensor is actually a little bit bigger than Micro Four Thirds, allowing us to have true multi-aspect ratios meaning you can punch in, you can go three, two, four, five, 69, whatever aspect ratio you want to set in, three, four, and not be cropping into the shot. 
you're using, a, instead of just going like this in the center, you could potentially be doing this. Like it gets wider and narrower like so. So it's an interesting thing. It's gonna take some time to really fully understand and I'll have to get my hands on a camera, of course, to really, really grok it. But that is my understanding of what that means. So huge difference there. All right, next up. Next up is the dual native ISO. Again, a really, really big deal, especially for those shooting in low light situation, which obviously goes along with the low light capabilities of the camera. L dual native ISO means it shoots natively at 400 and at 2500 ISO. Shooting at your native ISO means you get the best image quality possible. You're not gaining up the sensor. You're not telling it to absorb more light than it's capable of gaining it in software. Essentially, you are saying this is a native view of the sensor. This is the best possible image quality. So to be able to go switch between 400 and 2500 native is phenomenal. I have absolutely no idea how that actually works because it's not two sensors. It's not like it's going, oh, swapping a different sensor. I don't know how this works, but it does. So dual native ISO. This isn't new to to sensors, this is new to the Lumix cameras. Uh, this kind of tech is a, is previously existing, so it's not some crazy new thing, but it uh, it's kind of awesome that it's there. So again, if you're shooting low light, this is the camera to have. All right, next up. Oh, actually, back to that, sorry, back to that real quick. The extended ISO on this goes all the way up to 204,000 ISO, whereas on the GH5, it extends up to 25,600. So that is a massive, massive difference in there. Okay, let's, uh, real quick, I'm going to switch over to the comments because there are a lot flying by here. I wanna make sure I'm addressing these as we go. Uh, someone's asking what IBIS is, IBIS, that's in-body image stabilization. So we're gonna talk about the stabilization more in a little bit, but that's what IBIS means. Kevin Wright is asking, how's the video tethering over USB for the S? I have absolutely no idea, Kevin. Do not have information on that yet. Uh, let's see here where the comments go. Uh, John, we already answered your question about the time code, and that's it. So again, if you have questions while we're doing this and you're watching live, type them into the chat. Make sure you type at Photo Joseph in front of them. Those are the only comments that I'm going to see because we're, we've got a lot of people watching live, and I don't want to scroll through everything here. Okay, uh, next up, let's go back to this, and the next one is in-body stabilization. Okay, so let's talk about this now. The GH5S does not have any. The GH5 has a five-axis, five-stop stabilization. It's, it's kind of fantastic, right? I mean, this is a really, really awesome stable. Why is my watch making noise? You be quiet. I guess I forgot to mute that. Um, the, the mute button. There we go. The in-body stabilization in the GH5 is phenomenal. It's best in class. It is just epically good. It is completely not in the GH5S. So here's, here's a few things that happen with this. I was talking about the sensor potentially being bigger, not confirmed. That's kind of my, my understanding slash belief is the sensor might be a little bit bigger than what we're used to, um, which is only possible because we don't have stabilization. But the main reason that we don't have stabilization is because that in-body stabilization has been a problem for a lot of filmmakers. If you are putting the camera on a car, for example, car mounted camera, very, very common thing. You're going to have stabilization on the rigging on the car. You don't need other stabilization competing with that. You don't need to have your sensor bouncing around competing with that. And the when you have a stabilized sensor, it is literally a sensor floating on a field of magnets. You can't lock it down. When you turn off image stabilization, it's not like the camera uh, just locks it in with grips and grabbing it. It's magnets that say, hold it in place here. But with a hard enough jolt, that can still move. Clearly not okay when you are doing something like driving a, a crash camera, um, uh, just putting this thing on a car in general, or the example that I gave earlier was having explosions nearby. If you're doing a film set and you've got explosions, those shock waves will actually move the sensor. That's not okay. So filmmakers, big cinema, Hollywood level filmmakers, needed a camera that did not have image stabilization in the body, so that is why it's been taken out. So, advantage GH5 on this one, unless, of course, that's what you need. All right, next up, the Cinema 4K frame rate. So, on the GH5, at Cinema 4K, C4K, that's the Cinema 4K aspect ratio, which is slightly larger than 4K, the maximum you could shoot was 24 frames per second, and that was at 42210-bit. The GH5S will also shoot 24p, 42210-bit. It'll also shoot 30p and 25p at 42210-bit, and it'll even do 60p and 50p at 4208-bit. So again, if you're shooting that true cinema aspect ratio, that true cinema size, 
you want that higher frame rate, you now have that capability. And you can do that for video work as opposed to true 24 cinema film. Um, if you're doing true 24, if that's your output, then it's probably, probably going to leave it at 24 anyway. But of course, you could go, say, 30 and get a little, what is it, like, a, was that 15% slowdown? I forget what the math is, but you get a little bit of slowdown on there if you wanted to. So uh, it's just more advantages, more options there that you have. Next up is variable frame rate, VFR. We actually have bumped up on the GH5S. 1080p can now shoot up to 240 frames per second on the GH5. It maxes out at 120. So 240 frames per second, 1080p, with the combination, with the addition of the low light capability, the extra low light sensor, we're gonna get some pretty sweet slow motion out of this. Now, one of the reasons that, I'm, now I'm kind of speculating here, but my understanding of the tech and my experience with this, when you're shooting, when you're shooting a higher frame rate, you need more light, right? Because if you're shooting at 180 degree shutter, then you need to have more light at a higher frame rate to get an equivalent exposure. If you were to shoot on the GH5S all the way up to 240 frames per second, that would be even more light that you would need. But if you don't have that low light, then you're cranking the ISO. So suddenly you're kind of really getting a noisier image. Hence comes in the GH5S that has this much superior G, uh, low light capability. Combine that with 240 frames per second, and now you get a camera that can shoot 240 frames per second and look really good. I think that on the GH5, if, if it could shoot 240 frames per second, it wouldn't look very good. Uh, you would have just have, have massive amounts of light, and of course that's not normal when you're shooting high speed unless you've got some really specialized setup. It's probably not what you're normally doing. So uh, these combination of things, I think that the low light sensor, the this more low light capable sensor is really helping us do the 240 frames per second. Okay, well, let's take a look back at the comments again because a lot of those are flying by. Um, John says, surely that slide is wrong. The GH5 does 180 frames per second at 1080p. Didn't I say that? Oh, yeah, that was supposed to say, okay, you're right, John. Um, here, I'm gonna fix that because I typed, I mistyped that. What was it supposed to say? Was that right, 180? See, now I'm forgetting. Somebody, is it 180 or is it 120? Now I'm forgetting what my 180 is correct. You're saying, okay, we're going to fix that slide. That's just me. I made this slide this morning, and it would appear that I got something wrong. Okay, so we'll bring that back up in a second here. All right, uh, let me go back to the comments here and see what else is going on. Um, let's find where I left off. And Martin says, I just hope they have not limited or halted planned improvements to the GH5 to fit the GH5S in the market. Oh, no, absolutely not. These, like the G9, these are simultaneously being developed cameras. No worries, the GH5 is not yesterday's camera by any stretch. Okay, um, everybody's confirmed the 180 frame per second. Yes, thank you, sorry about that, guys. Just had that wrong on there, and I guess that's it. Okay, cool. So now, let's go for, and let's do this. I've got my next little thing up here. It's just kind of a, a comparison to show winner, winner. So the sensor size, there is no winner here because there are advantages and disadvantages to both sensors. The ISO, clearly having the dual native ISO and the higher ISO capability is awesome on the GH5S, so we're gonna give that to that. Uh, for stabilization, since you don't have it on the S, that win goes to the GH5, unless you don't want it. If you don't want it or don't need it, then the GH5S, great. But most of us want that stabilization. So that is definitely gonna be on the GH5. Cinema 4K frame rate up to 60p, and the VFR up to 240 frames per second. So there's that. Tyler is asking, how intense does the GH5 need to shake for the IBIS to become an issue? I, I don't have a, any kind of quantifiable number for you, but given that the examples that I've been given are things like explosions on set, that's going to be pretty big movement. Not the kind of thing you're going to come across in regular shooting. So, uh, yeah, it's it's not something you'd come across. If you put the camera on a gimbal, on a regular gimbal, something you buy from B&H, and you turn off stabilization in the body because you want it only to be in the gimbal, unless people are setting bombs off next to you, you're not going to see anything happen. This is really, again, for that cinema crowd, that big movie crowd. Um, if you're, if you're doing a car mount, if you've got a car with a Russian arm on it or you're just mounting to the car to do green screens or so, whatever, and you've got your stabilization rig on there and you're hitting hard bumps with the car, maybe you're driving off road, doing jumps, whatever, that sort of thing, that's where it could become an issue. So it's pretty extreme. It's pretty extreme, but uh, it happens. And that's why it was developed this way because the market asked for it. Uh, okay, next up, let's move on now to my second page of slides. That brings us to Vlog. On the GH5S, it's pre-installed. On the GH5, it's a $100 upgrade. So available on both, capable on both. It's just on the GH5, you have to add it in. So that's already already added in for you. 
Anamorphic, here's a big interesting difference. You have anamorphic 4K on the GH5S, but you have high resolution anamorphic on the GH5. This is something you don't have on the S. Why is that? Well, high resolution anamorphic, this is that, it's been called 6K anamorphic. It's, it's just, you're taking more of the sensor, you're using more of the resolution, you're getting an even bigger image. Why isn't that on the GH5S? Because of the lower resolution sensor. Remember, it's only a 10 megapixel sensor. So if you're shooting that super high resolution uh, anamorphic, that virtually 6K anamorphic, and I'm doing air quotes because it's, it's 6K depending on how you do the math, uh, you don't have that capability on the 5S. So very important differentiation right there. Next up is the time code support. So in and out via the PC sync port. So someone had already asked, could this be added to the GH5? I'm Right now the answer is I don't know. I don't think it can though. I think that the port, that little PC port, that's that port that you've looked at on your camera and gone, the hell is that thing for? It's for a very old fashioned style of shooting flash. You take the PC sync cord, you know, your old reliable standby, you get absolutely no TTL type of data, whatever. It's simply a physical connection where the camera tells the flash to fire and that's it. Really cheap sync, the sync cords are really cheap, running for super long lengths, they're great. Um, not used that commonly anymore, but you know, they're absolutely there. That port is now double duty on the GH5S, where it's still a PC sync port, but it also is used for time code. So again, I, I believe that that is special hardware, so I don't think that's something that could be added to the GH5. I could be wrong, but that's what I'm gonna say right now is, it's probably not going to, probably not going to come. Uh, all right, so let's see here. Tyler is saying, I think you'll be fine. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, and, and that's, I think that's what we're saying. I think a lot of GH5 owners right now, are, of course, are a little bit nervous going, oh, well, the S, the, oh man, is that the camera I'm going to want? Unless you have that specialized need, I think you're going to be perfectly fine and in some cases even better off with the GH5. So, you know, I think, I think we're going to be okay. Uh, let's see here. John Morby says they're using the flash port, but as someone said here, it can be done over the audio port too. Well, that's interesting. Hmm. Didn't know that. Interesting. Well, it would be cool. It would be cool to add in. All right, let's go on to the next slide. Next one shows low light autofocus capability. So because of this more capable low light sensor, you do get autofocus capability on slightly darker scenes, minus five EV versus minus four EV on the GH5. And then there's the price. The GH5S is a more expensive camera. It is a $2,500 camera versus the $2,000 for the GH5. So a little bit of a difference in there, pretty significant difference in there. And there's our advantages. So pre-installed Vlog L, nod or advantage to the GH5S. Anamorphic, if you're shooting anamorphic and you're, you like that idea of the super high res anamorphic, you get higher res anamorphic on the GH5. Time code on the GH5S, minus five EV on the GH5S and a lower price point on the GH5. Five. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is the series of slides that I prepared comparing the two. So let me see if there's anything else in here that uh, that I want to address in the comments. Um, <laughs> Burns Tech is saying it's very similar to carpentry tools. There are many different types of hammer, screws, drivers, etc. They're specific to a task, though it can be used for many different uses. Yeah, this this camera is a specialized camera. This is not. If you're a vlogger, this is not the camera for you, right? It is. Uh, I saw someone ask about autofocus. There's actually, oh, I, I think I left that out of the slides. I forgot to put that in, but autofocus is actually for stills, specifically for stills, is slightly faster on the GH5 versus the GH5S. So there's that in there. There's no autofocus improvements for video because let's face it, the type of people who are buying this couldn't care less about autofocus. Autofocus is probably the least concern for the target market of this particular camera. Uh, Daddy MCC says, we'll have to watch the upload you just got here. Well, welcome, and you'll have to watch the upload. Mm, let's see here. So uh, Marvin's saying the killer for you is the price. See, it's more expensive. This is not for everybody. There is no question about that. Uh, let's see, anything else that I've missed? It doesn't look like I have. So I think we're going to wrap it up right there because that is everything that I wanted to tell you. We will know more in the coming days as more information is uh, is unearthed about the camera. Panasonic has already least released a couple of videos. Watch the sample videos, but watch the behind the scenes because those are really, really cool. Uh, there's some really good behind the scenes stuff that, uh, that looks fantastic and really explains the kind of, the approach to why this camera would be used, the kind of environments, kind of situations it would be used in, and it will help to understand its place in the market, I think, for a lot of us. So, all right, um, we're going to, yep, that's about it. We're gonna bail out of here. Thanks a bunch for tuning in, everybody. Thank you for coming to this uh, spontaneous Photo Justice Photo Moment show. We'll be back Wednesday for our regularly scheduled programming. See you later, bye-bye.